All right, folks, before we head back to court, I want to bring in our guests for this hour, trial attorneys Alexis Rosenberg and Vonda Sargent. Thank you both for joining me this evening. Truly appreciate it. Vonda, I'll start with you. The state decided, or the Commonwealth decided, to start with the daughter of both the victim and the defendant. Clearly, she's right in the middle of all this. Um, uh, the mother called her downstairs. She was upstairs at the time of the incident. And I, had, I wondered about the decision to call her first, but she was a wealth of information, clearly. What are your thoughts on calling her first and also what she provided for the state? I think it was wise to call her first. I think um, having her the first person that the jury sees because she was actually at the scene was a very good idea. I think the information that she provided is absolutely fascinating because it helps both sides. Um, from what I've gathered right now, it appears as though the state is going for a argument that this woman, the wife, uh, is controlling. Um, she's unable to forgive the um, affair. She did everything she possibly did to, to, good to make sure that her husband would still find her attractive. She stayed fit. Her whole life was Zumba and she did everything she was supposed to do and that was not enough. And she ultimately killed him. I think that's the state's theory. And I think the defense theory and all of this from the testimony from the daughter is that um, the father um, has early onset dementia with the memory loss, the getting angry from not being able to have that cognitive ability, and then the mixing of the alcohol and the Adderall. So I think we're going to see some experts from the defense talking about the impact of mixing those two drugs. And I think we probably will have an expert talking about what early onset dementia and how it presents itself early on early earlier in people's lives yeah. so that's what i think is happening right now all right fair enough alexis i want to get your thoughts particularly about those issues number one i was wondering what how the memory thing would play into this case as far as the adderall and the drinking we know that he was sober left that all behind for about two years before this actual incident so it's interesting to see how the defense will try to connect those things but my takeaway and i think this was very damaging for what the defense is trying to establish Mom was controlling, as Vonda said. She was the instigator of most of the fights. We all heard this from the daughter. And also, no physical violence from the father ever in the home, as far as she saw. What do you make of it? I agree with you, Michael. I, I think that the defense does have a problem at this point. Uh, you know, because she's setting the tone of the house, that the mother was, it appears from the testimony, upset rightfully so over the divorce, was really controlling where he was going, what he was doing, keeping an eye on him. And that, you know, I don't know about this memory thing, bringing it out with her, though. I have to say, I'm not so sure if I was the attorney that I would have really honed in on the memory thing with the daughter. But I think kind of sprinkling the memory thing, we are definitely going to see experts that are going to show the impacts related to past alcohol use, because we've had testimony to this point that he wasn't currently using, combined with the use of the Adderall and possibly other drugs that he may or may not have been using um, at the time or leading up to this. Because we could have the dementia based on heavy um, alcohol use and possible drug use prior leading up to that. It didn't have to be right at this given moment, as, as most of us know. Yeah, fair enough. And I think you might be right, Vonda, because right. there was testimony elicited about his frustration and aggravation with not being able to remember right. things. And we know sometimes folks with dementia getting into those sort of rhythms, they can be very violent sometimes. So that might be part of why right. they explain he might have attacked her under those circumstances. All right, ladies, stand by. I want to take folks back into court. The defendant's adopted son, Angel Ritchie, is now on the stand. Let's get you back into court. And after specifically January 28th, when something happened at your house, did you go and live with another family member for a couple yeah. months? Um, my grandfather's. And then eventually um, you were able to move back to Marine Street. Yeah. And um, where was your bedroom in, in the Marine Street house? Basement. And um, prior to January 28th of 2021, who else lived in the house at Marine Street? You said prior, so before him? Yes. Um, me, my sister, dad and, um, dad and um, mom. Okay. Um, and if it's okay, I want to talk about those people that you just mentioned, okay. your sister, your mom, and your dad. Um, who's your mom? What's her name? Christine uh, Richie Slash Sanchez. 
And do you see her in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you just tell us um, something that she's wearing, like a color of a piece of clothing she's wearing? Uh, blazer. Beige blazer. May the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. Any objection? No, Your Honor. That record will so reflect. In, um, in January of 2021, did, did um, your mom work? I believe so. It would have been online Zumba, I believe. Okay. Um, um, and other than kind of doing Zumba, did you know her to have any other jobs outside the house or was she primarily kind of at home? Most part at home. Did you know if she was um, engaged in any classes during that time period? School, I believe so, yeah. Okay. And would that be college or high school? Yes, college. And do you know what she was studying at that time? Uh, psychology would have been my, my would, would be my best guess. Okay. And um, you also mentioned that during that time period, your father was living in the home. Yeah. Who was your father? Michael Ritchie, Michael Joseph Ritchie. And is that your biological father? No. Um, when did you come to know Michael? My whole life. Your whole life? Yeah. And um, at some point, did, did he become your, your father legally? 2004. And so in 2004, did Michael legally adopt you? Yes. And is that when you took the Richie name? Yes. And so what did you call him? What did you call him? I always called him dad. Always dad? Yeah. And did you know what Michael did for a living? Firefighter. And then um, part-time, he had the, the fire sprinkler um, company stuff. So uh, whatever that entitles. Okay. And did he work with a particular person that you and your family knew at the fire sprinkler company? Um, one of them, uh, Mark McDonald, would have been his uh, higher up. Okay, is that somebody that you um, knew as a family friend? Yeah, we would have referred him as uncle through my father, yeah. And um, your father passed away, correct? Yeah. And when, when was that that he passed away? January either 27th or 28th, um, 21, 21. Do you know how old he was when he passed away? Seven? Uh, I can't remember. Okay. Um, you also mentioned at, at that time in January of 2021, your sister was living in the home, right? What's your sister's name? Sophia. And how old is she? 20. And do you have any other siblings? Michael. A little Michael. Little Michael. And so um, fair to say he's a junior. Yeah. And is that what you and the family call him as little Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Now, in January of 2021, was Michael Jr. living in the home on Marine Street? That month? Yes. No. <laughs> Do you know when? All right, so three kids in the Ritchie household. There was Angel, who was the oldest but not the biological son of Michael Ritchie. Then Michael Jr., who was the middle child. Sophia was the youngest. All right, we need to take a break. The defendant's son continues his testimony on direct examination. When we return, keep it here on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. We're continuing our coverage in the murder trial of Christine Ritchie in Massachusetts. Now, she claims she killed her husband, Michael, in self-defense when he tried to attack her. Well, the couple's son is now on the stand on direct examination. Let's get back into court. Do you know when Michael um, stopped living at the house on Moraine Street, when he moved out? I can't give you the exact date, but I can say prior, before... Like, there was at least two or two years before um, my father's passing. Okay, so two years before 2021, you think he, like he moved out? Yeah. Okay. And at the time, in January of 2021, did Michael still have a room at the Marine Street house with, like, where his belongings would be or he could sleep if he stayed? Um, no. Um, my parents uh, were working things out with him to try to, like, grab what he needs when he left, um, and then the rest was just kind of like, it's whatever. Um, 
Did he have a bedroom there growing up? Yeah, yeah. So he had it growing up. But, um, my mom eventually turned it into like her own like personal work workout zone um, once he moved out officially. Okay. Now, um, can you tell us um, a little bit about your parents' relationship back in 2018? What was their relationship like? Exactly 2018 or? Around that time period. Um. Well, maybe I can ask you a different question if that's. Yeah, I mean, okay. like, I would need like a. Sure. So growing up, did your parents appear to have um, a good relationship in your eyes as a child? Most part, yeah. Okay. At some point as you got older and became an adult, did you see their relationship change? Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. Was there any particular um, event that you can recall in your parents' marriage where you started to see that change? The uh, affair. Okay, and when you say the affair, what do you mean? My father, or my mom finding out that my father cheated on her. And did you learn that from both your mother and your father, that that had been what happened? Just through arguments and stuff, yeah. And so when your mother learned about the affair, um, did you notice changes in her demeanor on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. What kinds of things did you notice changed? Secluded. Um, like <sighs> angry, I guess, like just like at just the situation she was in. And confused, too, at the same time. Okay. So would you hear her yell a lot more than you had heard her yell in the past? Yeah. I mean, those past three years to his, last, to his final day um, was, like, any, like, abnormal as it could come, you know? Like, um, the fights were just, ongoing you know so it wasn't that wasn't normal having that many fights and then on top of it that long of a period too of time fights are going on that wasn't normal at all okay and um would you be around hearing and seeing these fights yeah without even me like having a point like if i was in the basement there was no getting away from it so I, you I was just i could hear the muffles and stuff and loudness and it's just yeah Okay, and would you hear both your mom and your dad's voices during those arguments? Yeah. Um, would there be any one voice that you'd hear more than the other in those arguments? Objection, Your Honor. He can answer if he knows. I can't necessarily say because they there'd be times where one would overtake the other, and so it's okay. Anything else that you observed about the changes in in your mom's demeanor or how she would behave around the house? after she learned of the affair? Um, I, I think she just wanted the truth. I, like, that she was just persistent. She, she was persistent about getting the truth. Okay. What about the, um, what about the house itself? Um, prior to her learning of the affair, um, what was the kind of state of your house? Was it always neat and tidy or? Your Honor. Basis. Relevance. Overall. So was the house kind of neat and tidy before? Um, it got to a point where like, it seemed like my father was picking up the slack. Um, So would you see your dad kind of pick everything up? Right, well, like... All right, we need to step away here for a moment. When we return, Angel Richie continues testifying about his mother and father's turbulent relationship. We'll be here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. All right, folks, we'll get back to court in just a minute. But first, let's bring back in our guest trial attorneys, Alexis Rosenberg and Vonda Sargent. Alexis, I'll start with you. Uh, the state started with the daughter, Sophia. They followed that up now with another child, uh, Angel. And he's the adopted son, has very nice things to say uh, about the victim in this case. But again, 
he is someone who was not in the House at the time, but he's going to be like a scene setter. Again, someone to give us some context as to the relationship between those two. Very important for the state. I agree, because what he's testifying, this is a very hostile house. There was a lot of tension going on, and the testimony states that the mother was very angry about this affair. She seemed to not be able to be moving past, seemed to be escalating. What hasn't come out, and I'm curious to wait to hear, is whether they're going to elicit testimony about whether it brought, it, it escalated to um, physical because right now we've only heard there's been a lot of yelling and everybody seemed to be hiding um, to get away from this. And it was going on on a regular basis. But we haven't gotten, was there anything that became physical during these arguments? Yeah, well, we heard nothing on the part, at least as what the kids saw, uh, on the part of the father. But there will be testimony, according to pretrial motions, that people saw him, the victim, with uh, uh, bruises and also a cut. Well, the daughter did talk about a cut lip. So I think there was some violence going from the defendant to the victim. Vonda, quickly, um, a lot of this we're talking about, a lot of the testimony that's being elicited now from these first two witnesses goes to motive. Now, we certainly know that the state doesn't need to prove motive, but in a case like this, where the only real living witness is the defendant to this, and she's likely going to testify and tell her story, the idea of motive becomes very, very important for this jury to understand what really happened between those two. You know, I, I agree with you on that. They don't have to prove it, but I think that Angel did give us the motive. Um, one line that really stuck out to me was that she was persistent on getting the truth, which means she was ruminating about this. It went on and on for years on end, and he couldn't get away from the fighting. So I agree with Alexis 100% that there was a lot of hostility, a lot of tension in that household, and Angel told us that she was persistent on getting at the truth, which means she was just going on and on and on. And I don't think there was anything that Michael could have said to her to fulfill what it is that she needed uh, to hear from him about why he cheated on her. And so it's pretty clear to me that it's the cheating was the motivation for the mom to finally snap and in and, and Michael's life, according to the state's theory of the case. Yeah, it certainly seems that way at this point. All that tension in the house seemed to be coming from her and her inability to deal with the idea that he had this affair and, and, and get past it. All right, let's get back into court now. The son of the defendant and the victim is testifying about, again, the troubles between his parents.